Hope everyone's doing well. Welcome to Magia Mindset. Today's guest, we got none other than Katya Gokman. She's played for Florida State University, played professionally in Belgium for Angelacht, and yes, she's represented the Russian national team. Roll the intro. Katya, how you doing? I'm good, Sean. How are you? Good. Are you staying safe in Georgia? I am staying safe. It's getting hot over here. How is it though? Have you guys gone back to the lifestyle? Is it in the soccer world? How's it looking in Georgia? Yeah, so they've they've pretty much started opening everything back up. Restaurants are slowly starting to um, all be open. Um, I'm doing a bunch of private and group sessions. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's really busy soccer wise. The clubs, however, we're still not doing anything yet. Just Zoom stuff. Um, still pushing back tryouts. So we'll see. What it feels like that. this year is going to be a demand in private training. It mm-hmm. feels like the demand in private training is going to be high because the question mark of when are we going to get back? No one really has an answer for that. It could keep getting pushed back. But the, at least the private, people can start to get privates going because you get you can monitor that if it's groups of two or one. You know, yep. you can do your protocols with that. Because I no, think... Absolutely. Because I am going to set it up too. I'm actually going to... I got an LED thermometer. Oh, awesome. So to do that, and they're going to fill out waivers, liability form, kind of like that. And then we'll try to we'll do the um, social distancing as well um, to kind of stay on track with that. But yeah. So here it's um, uh, groups of 10, right? So nine plus a coach. Um, I've only been, the max I've done so far is six. Usually it's four or five. Um, so we'll see. We might start doing that more. We, I had a camp planned in July. For now, we're still a go, but I think it might be groups of 32 is the max now. For July, though. Yeah. So we'll see. But. No, it's, it's, it's definitely unique times, but, you know, <laughs> it's going to be interesting. My thing is I want to first start off and say thank you so much for putting in the time for this. Um, of course. I think um, I know your schedule is busy, and I truly appreciate it kind of um, putting in the time for this interview because I think they need to hear your voice as well. I think the, the young soccer players, female and male, need to kind of get your perspective and your story, especially during this time that a lot of people can't go outdoors and do activities. You know, hearing someone and their journeys, and during that time when they're there, they're kind of planning. Kids that are elite, they're planning. You know, when you were younger, you're probably like, this is a time if you can't play, you're watching others, listening to others. What can I plan so when we're back at it, I can get to where I can get to, if it's that aspiration. Well, it's, it's a pleasure, Sean. Really, I love everything you do. So it, I'd be a fool not to jump on this opportunity. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. So right off the bat, we'll start out as um, your whole soccer football journey uh, as a player, how you got started in it, and then from your player journey, how did you transition to becoming the coach you are today? Sure. Um, so I, I started a little bit later than most, so to speak. Um, I, I was nine. I know a lot of kids start like four or five. No, I, I did figure skating and I hated it. And I finally convinced my parents to let me play soccer. So started when I was nine, uh, you know, back in the day it was pretty simple. We had ODP was the big deal. So, you know, went through club, state cup, ODP, uh, region team, that jazz. Um, then I went to Fermi University. It's a small private D1 school for my first years because I actually tore my ACL right before college. So wow. it was kind of tough for me to find a college. Um, but Fermi offered me a scholarship. I took it. Two years in, sophomore year, I was like, okay, I, I feel like I've outgrown this. I need a bigger challenge. Um, so I sent my resume out to basically every SEC, ACC school. And I was like, well, let's see what happens. 
Um, and Florida State came back, and um, that, that ended up being where I went, finished up there. Um, throughout all this time, I was playing with the youth Russian national team, the U19s, so I got to travel around, play in the European Championship a few times. Um, basically, most of my senior year of high school, I was gone. I did not go to school. <laughs> I don't know how I did it, but somehow. Um, and then after Florida State, I started my first year playing professionally in Russia. Went with a teammate of mine, Tony Presley. She plays for Orlando Pride now. Um, and then just from there on, I finished a season, finished the contract, go to another season and contract with another club and it just happened to be that mostly it was in a different country every time so did that when I was 27 I came back summer finished playing in Belgium got my master's degree while I was there and I was like you know what I feel satisfied I think I think I've reached a good level I think I, it's time to move on it was very uh anticlimactic <laughs> there was no like oh this is my last season thanks everyone so, no just cut, came home and I was like I think I'm good so and then I transitioned I uh, I met the life university head coach we hit it off we worked at camp together and she offered me first a volunteer spot so I did that and I did privates on the side following year uh, she offered me an assistant coaching position and then I got into club soccer at NASA Topet as well. Um, so that's kind of the path that I've been on as of right now. No, that's great. And it's funny how you say you hit that point and you were satisfied. I went to Iran, and when I was playing in Iran, we were playing. It was unique stories in itself, and my passport getting lost, got to travel here to, for the trials and the trial stages. But when I was on a team and I was going, I think there was a segment where. I, it hit me inside that I'm like, I think I'm good. I think, I think I hit that level. I'm good. And I want to kind of come back to the States and I want to teach the game. I want to create a movement. I want to create something bigger than just a player. You know, I think a player you can do so much and influence too. I think there's so much, so much you can do behind the scenes as well. Great, long story short, great um, decision because a lot of my teammates and stuff, they can't travel back and forth with the old Donald Trump band. So great, <laughs> great, great, great setup uh, situation with that. But I want to kind of get into and dissect the part when you transition from a college act I athlete. I think some people face adversity in their youth, in college. But when you make a transition, there's no player that can't tell me they've never experienced adversity, rejection, um, going from a team to another team and completely having everything throughout their whole career handed. I think there's always that one point. I want to see if you can share with us your the most difficult adversity you face and what's the biggest... Um, thing you gained from it, lesson you learned from it. And if it, and if it ties into a very intriguing story as well, by all means. Uh, this I got one for you, Sean. I got one for you. Um, well, I mean, to start off, in general, absolutely, you're totally right. I mean, there's always adversity. Some get luckier than others, and they kind of are able to make each team and be successful on each team and make that easy transition. Um, but I think for most of us, um, there are – definitely walls that we hit and we question on do I continue this path you know is it worth it you know all those things you know come up um so my story for you is um uh, so the last team I played for Anderlecht in Belgium the way I got there was the most bizarre way um so I before them I was talking to a team in Holland here in Vane, uh in the top division but they were up north, kind of a no man's land Holland. There's really nothing there. So I went out there. I got settled, so to speak. And, and then we're trying to figure out what I had to do. It's really complicated with the visa there. You can't just come and play. Um, you have to make a certain amount of salary. Female players don't typically make that salary. So I was supposed to get a job. And then I had to get an apartment. And none of this stuff was going to be paid for. 
And I'm by myself in this small town, and I'm like, what did I get myself into? Um, in the meantime, one of my really good friends that I played with in Cyprus just got on Anderlecht in Brussels. So I call her up, and I'm like, hey, can you find out if I can just at least come on trial? Not asking for a contract. So she's like, all right, let me get back to you. I'll give him a call. As I'm waiting, I'm supposed to sign the contract, literally within hours. And I'm waiting, and this guy's like, all right, coming over to sign the contract. And as he's coming, she calls me, and she's like, if you can get there tomorrow, you can, you can do a trial. And so I have a split decision, and you know, I don't recommend this for everyone, but I, I told the guy I didn't feel well. So, so I could have some time. <laughs> the next day, I'm like, call the guy. I'm like, look, I need to get to town for a little bit. I need to figure things out. Pack up all my stuff. I jump on the train in North Holland to Brussels, about six, seven-hour train, left at 7 a.m. And I was like, what am I doing? Get to Brussels later that day. The manager picks me up. Cool. I'm on trial. Well, they have the same visa situation there. And my 90-day visa is about to end because I had spent time training and playing in Iceland for a little bit. So I came straight from Iceland to Holland. So my 90-day visa is ending. I'm on this trial. And they're like, hey, you know, we like you. Come with us to this tournament in Spain. You know, we play Atletico Madrid. We play Montpellier, uh, Valencia. I'm like, I can't pass this up. So luckily, we're in the Schengen visa area, so I don't need my passport because my 90 days are up. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm a felon. <laughs> um, so I go there. We do well. Awesome. They're like, hey, we'd like you to play with us. Awesome. I still need a visa. So how do I get this visa? So I'm like, well, I'm going to apply to the university in Brussels, and I'm going to see if I get in and I can, become, and I can get my student visa. So I, mind you, the application process was already over. You know, it's it's about to be fall. You know, uh, the start of fall semester. I'm going through all these offices. I'm trying to find the ins and outs. My manager luckily helps me out. Underlooks a big club. They know people. So I get my application in. Great. Well, now the guy who stamps the visas is out on holiday because all Europeans take about two month holidays. And we all know that when they're in a holiday, no one else does their job. So there was about a month or two where I was just the most stressed out I could ever been because I didn't have my visa yet. I've overstayed. I'm keep, I keep getting letters saying, Hey, you have to leave the country. <laughs> and they're telling me to just ignore it. <laughs> then I find out that my first you know, application for this, for the visas that got denied and I'm like oh my gosh the guy's like don't worry we're gonna try again last last ditch effort so long story short finally get my student visa I get into the you know the master's program at you know, in Brussels and I get on this team and I was like well I might as well get my master's now that I've made it into the program so that whole year I did my master's program and I played and it was, I mean, I, I think that story just led up to how the rest of the year was going to be. It was extremely challenging, a lot of ups and downs, but then literally the day before I left in the summer, I was like, wow, this was the most difficult year so far of my life and yet the most rewarding year of my life. And I think that when we go back to looking at when do we feel like we're ready to move on, um, I looked back and I was like, I can't go up from this. I mean, I think I'm, I think I'm good. Like, I've done all I could. I lived in an awesome city, played in a great club. I'm, I'm done chasing. So that's my story. <laughs> no, a great story. And I think the thing that – stands out the most and I want to kind of break it down and get your opinion on it is I think especially in today's maybe generation as well some of the young athletes the female and uh, males that haven't maybe gone through division one 
national team or even high level professional, what is the mindset that it take? You know, emotionally, physically, you know, the fitness test, the showing up every day, the professionalism, you know, what are those in a day to day basis based on you going to FSU, you going to the national team, you going to Belgium? What is it that you really are like, man? This is like, if, if you don't have these one, two, three, four, five, wherever your list is, you can't cut it. You can't make it. Um, I, I think it's consistency. Um, you know, in, in your day-to-day routines and what you do, you have to be consistent. You just can't afford to be here and there and all over the place. You have to have a schedule. You have to have a routine. Um, so it's a lot easier in college because they kind of make it for you. Um, but when you go play professionally, yes, you already have the scheduled games, the scheduled practices, but what you do around that time is up to you. So if you're out late going out all the time, well, you're not probably not going to be ready for practice or the game. Uh, you know, that stuff, especially when you get older, starts to affect you. <laughs> so um, I'd say the biggest challenge – from college to professional was the mental aspect because everybody's good. You know, every, you know, everybody's good. Everybody's technical. That aspect is kind of like something you just have to maintain. You know, everybody's going to be fit. So you just have to, like I said, stay consistent. But then it's the mindset of, again, staying consistent when you're playing of can you perform on a consistent basis and not be super great one day and then just completely horrible the next because coaches want someone who can consistently perform. There's going to be bad games. Everybody has those. But if they know that, okay, that's just a bad game, that's different to, hey, I can't really rely on this player. Um, But it's – tough I mean the mental aspect for me personally as a player was the toughest thing I, I mean I last year you know, like I said it was full of ups and downs I got a sports psychologist because it was so hard to keep up and stay consistent with the mental aspect um, physically I could do it no problem what you go run you go train you do an extra stress session easy but staying consistent up here man that's that's tough <laughs> Well, it, it is. It is. I mean, especially when you're making jump to jump to jump, going from your youth level, especially if you're if you're the hot shot youth level, and you go into the college. You just said it. There is a level now. I'm at a different level. People are pretty good. You got the best of the youth player in this district, this one, this state, this state. Now from college, you went to Belgium. Now you got the best person in here. So you're moving up those levels. And you're like, okay, what I did back then doesn't work now. What I did here doesn't work now. Who, when you went through this journey and this intriguing journey is either who you played with or you went against, who is the most talented and most tenacious competitor you ever played with or went against and what made them that kind of animal in your opinion? Honestly, I have to go back to Florida State. Um, you know, I, you go through all these professional teams, and obviously there's – I can pick out a, more than a handful of players that are extremely good. But, again, it's, it's professional, and you have different teams. You have a lot of them. Florida State, at the time that I went, right, it was – I mean, it still is, but best in the nation, top three at least. And then if we're looking from that age perspective – probably best in the world because he only recruits the best of the best. And if he can't get, if Mark can't get it in the U S well, he's going to go find that player somewhere in Europe or Asia because that's just the way he is. So, I mean, I was playing with French players, Asian players. uh, I mean, you know, German. So just like you mentioned, I was, you know, we were all hot shots where we came from. And now there's all of us in this one program. Um, and I'm talking, I was playing with players like Tony Presley, who plays for Orlando Pride. Casey Short, plays for the U.S. national team in Chicago Red Stars. Um, Enos Jarena, plays for the French national team, gets called up, plays for uh, Paris, FC, I think. 
Um, so Tori Huster um, plays, I think, Washington Spirit also was called up for the national team. So, I mean, it, it's, it's those players that you look at and you're like, sweet, I got to play with those guys. Um, but even back then, yeah, I mean, what made them so successful and continue, you know, their path is, is their mental game. They were all good. They were all gifted, but they could also take the pressure and deal with it. They wouldn't choke. They'd just go out and do what they do. Um, and that's really hard to do. And that's why the best of the best are the best of the best. You know, there's a lot of great players with technique and that are strong, that are fast, but you got it. You, you go to a level where now it's mental. Um, and that's, that's the U S national team for you. That's all those top players. That's what they're good at. And it's, and it's funny how you said that bell jump. But in, the, I, in my opinion, and I think uh, everybody will have their opinion as well in the, in the women's game, especially until everyone catches up, I feel the, the NCAA Division I, especially the bigger universities like UNC, FSU, are, are going to have a better setup than even some professional teams. Just because how U.S. is structured with the freedom and the rights they have. I mean, the access of resources women have in America – is pretty similar to the to the male. Co- some countries might not have those access, and that's why it's funny how you said I got to go back to FSU because your probably FSU team can compete with some of the teams in Europe. They can be as competitive with that. Now I want to go back to what you said in FSU, having all of those players that are playing currently at a high level. Any story of competitive fire, tussle, you go at anyone and they're like in your face about it. First initiation as a rookie, anything like that <laughs> you remember? Oh, gosh. Um, so Mark did a really good job of having a very kind of respectful environment. It was a lot of hard work. It was grind. We were all physical with each other. But nobody got mad at each other because we all knew this is what's expected and this is what it takes to fight for that position. So I can't say I ever got mad at anyone there or we anyone. There was some stuff outside. There always is because we're girls. Um, So (laughs) there were things that happened off the field in our day-to-day lives that some girls definitely butt heads. There were things that were done that, that had to be addressed. But it, when it came to stepping on the field, uh, we did not, at least from what I remember, let it affect how we played or how we acted. Was it the balance of the coach's environment with the players, or was it just you guys had that player that doesn't matter who was in place of those coach as a coach, the players was going to do that, or the coach did a lot of good stuff not allowing it to get like that? Well, it's definitely a balance, but I can't say we had rules per se. Actually, it was quite the opposite. He didn't give us any rules. It was just what was expected of us. And because most of us wanted to go play professionally and we had that drive, um, it made us kind of follow that path. It's a lot harder when you go to other programs where a lot of the girls, they just want a good time. They want to enjoy their college. They're not going to go play pro. And that's where you got to kind of set some boundaries. Um, but when you're at a level like that and everybody wants to succeed, yeah, you don't really need to worry no, too much. It, it's great. And I, like, I've learned that as well. Sometimes I'm like, you, you look back, you're like, that coach doesn't even know what he's doing. He's not even coaching. <laughs> but when you get older and you look back, you're like, man, he was a genius because he knows, what, he knows, he knows the players he had at his hand. And they don't want to be told, do this, do that. They know. They're professionals. Their mindset is kind of built like they, they don't want to cut the corner because they want to be one of the best ones and make that jump. And I think that's a good trait for a coach. And kudos as, for your coach at Florida. And sometimes those great qualities teaches us later on down the line too. So great setup. Um, but, uh, our next segment that I wanted to kind of go into is kind of, it's a unique time. COVID-19 pandemic, I think 
uh, for me in my personal lifetime, I've never experienced anything like this. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was going to kind of say, not only I think you are a good professional, not only for the young female athletes, but also the male athletes as well with the same mindset and attributes. During this time, you know, going, if you got to take yourself in their shoes, maybe eight years old, nine years old, 10, all the way to college 22, you know, trying to make it, but you, you got this time out. You got this time out right now. You know, what is it that you would say to do during this time? And how do you emotionally um, see the light at the end of the tunnel going to be really bright? Man, that's, I mean, that's a tough one. Um, because as a kid, I, I can only imagine that right now kids are kind of getting bored. They're kind of like, eh, what's next? It's hard to see so far ahead when you're young. Um, but one thing that I can personally say that I'm at least working on with my players, because I think it's so important, is first touch. Um, and a lot of the stuff that I have them do, they can do on their own, juggling, popping it up, collecting at different parts of the body. Um, I think if you want to progress and keep going, first touch is so critical because the older you get, the faster the game gets, you get less touches. So, I mean, what's important is what can you do with the one, two touches that you have, um, especially the way that we want to, most of our kids to play these days is so quick. So I, I think first touch is a huge one. Um, also, I think this is a great time to watch soccer reruns. Um, we kind of talked about this last week in the Zoom meeting that we had with the other coaches, but it's, it's those little things like body positioning um, and spacing. And as a coach, I knew as a player, but I didn't pay attention to it so much until I started teaching it of, wow, this is really what soccer is about. It's your spacing. It's your timing. It's your first touch. If you can get those things, the rest of the stuff, in my opinion, comes easy. Um, always teachable. Physical aspects, you can always get fit. Um, but these basics, in my opinion, for me, that's what made me successful. I was a small kid. I was moderately average fast. Nothing special physically. Um, you talk to the Florida State coach, he'll tell you I wasn't physically gifted So <laughs> compared to the other players we had. Um, so it was my technique that carried me through. And it's the same with any player. No matter how big or strong or fast you are, you're eventually going to run into some of the same size and speed. So I think the foundations of your technical game, your passing game, your IQ, that's what kids need to focus on. What about emotional? Because I've had some players that, even, even for my um, classroom sessions as well, there's some kids and even adults to a point 18 year old to 19 years old that got emotional like they emotionally uh, lost motivation they emotionally were not inspired how do you stay hungry how do you stay driven you know during a time like i said when when you in in any natural thing when a parent puts you in time out you know you're like man i'm bored i'm not <laughs> motivated how do you push through that emotionally that's, that's a good point. Um, I can only speak for what hypes me up. Maybe it's a good example or not. Um, what I did a lot as a player to get myself motivated and hyped up, because we don't, we're not always motivated. We're not always excited. I mean, that, that's normal. Um, for me, it was YouTube videos. I would watch, I loved watching Cristiano Ronaldo YouTube videos. I think his moving off the ball is phenomenal. He's not the only one. There's a lot of great players to watch. So, but it was YouTube videos and it was podcasts. Um, obviously, I, I don't think 10-year-olds are going to want to listen to podcasts, but YouTube videos, I think, is a great resource. I mean, there's so much online. And for me, oh, that stuff hyped me up. Um, but I, I think they need to take time to figure out what it is, but also not be discouraged if they – don't feel motivated. It's okay. It happens. Mm. Uh, sometimes we get more burned out. Maybe we do need a break. No, for sure. For sure. I imagine a lot of parents are kind of trying to 
get on top of this thing right now and make their kids do as much as possible. Uh, you know, I know a few kids like that. Um, but I think we also need to remember that they also need a break. Yeah. So. No, fantastic. Fantastic. You know, Katya, before I let you uh, close it, uh, uh, let us go and go on our ways. Um, I have to ask you two questions. Okay. One, what's your favorite team of all time, female or male? What's your favorite player of all time, female or male? And kind of uh, elaborate the behind the. Uh, okay. The they go hand in hand. Okay. It's the uh, the '98 to the 2002 kind of French national men's team. Okay. You know they had Henri, they had Zidane. I mean, you, you, they just they were unbelievable. Um, and my favorite player of all time is Zinedine Zidane. Uh, and both those things are my favorite because it's a bit of nostalgia. It's my childhood. Uh, I I cried when Zidane got you know headbutted and got a red card. Uh, I think that was two thousand six, was it? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, very emotional day for me. Uh, <laughs> and the Italians won. Wasn't happy, but that's that's my that's my childhood. That's my nostalgia. Zidane was the guy who really kind of made me want to pursue this career. Um, and he's just unbelievable. He was one of my favorites. So fun to watch. Now fun to watch coach. I mean, he's just the best of both worlds. So no, he's, a, he's a genius. He's a genius. It's funny how you picked that France national team uh, from 98 to 2002. I, I thought even 2006 was one of the yeah. World Cup. I mean, if he doesn't get red carded, a, a, a chip PK <laughs> on Buffon. Oh. I, mean, I think during that time it was Zidane and you had Ronaldinho. Ronaldinho, Ronaldinho was something else. I think he had a different movement where I don't think before him you've ever seen um, players being competitive and fierce, but with a smile on your face. I mean, he had the biggest buck teeth but he had a smile on his face and he would run with a celebration. Kids wanted to like have it, that long hair and everything. But Zidane was, Zidane was special too. I saw a picture, I think it was the 2006 World Cup, of all the superstars that were in that World Cup. And it's unbelievable because you already had Cristiano Ronaldo in there, but you still had Luis Figo in there. But then you had all the Italian dudes that won it before. And you had the Brazilian guys, and I think maybe Roberto Carlos was still there. I mean, it, it was on. It's probably it had it, to be like the best World Cup. It has to be up there. I mean, you had Messi in it and Cristiano that are yeah, the young guys. carrying the sport, and then you had like all of the big faces of all the nations. Like, yeah, yeah 2006 was pretty star-studded show out there. Awesome. That's a good. That's good memories. Perfect. So. And, um, hey, thank you again, Katya, for putting in the time. Um, at this platform, anything you want to plug in, anything you have, the club you're working at, college you're working at, um, anything you're kind of coming up with, ideas that you want to kind of get out there and kind of uh, yeah, no, um, audience on the lookout. Kind of similarly to what you're doing on the side right now, um, a good friend and coach of mine. We also kind of created something similar here in the Southeast uh, called Process FC, Process Football Community. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're just really passionate about expanding the idea. We have a blog. We do, you know, camps and sessions locally at the moment. But um, our blogs are pretty neat. We kind of just speak our minds. So it's uh, www.processfc.com. So. Processfc.com. Yeah, it's uh, – We'll put it out. Cool. Thank you again. Thanks so much, Sean. I appreciate it. My pleasure.